The Biodiversity of Spiders, Part 2, The Arachnid Orders. We can infer that the common ancestor of the Calicerata had chelate mouthparts, two body regions, four pairs of legs, compound eyes, and lived underwater. Pycnogonids, or sea spiders, are strange marine animals that seem to consist almost entirely of legs. They range in size with leg spans from uh, one millimeter to over 70 centimeters. Most are toward the smaller end of this range and inhabit relatively shallow depths. The Zephosera includes the horseshoe crabs and the extinct sea scorpions known as Eurypterids. Of course, horseshoe crabs are not really crabs at all. Horseshoe crabs are living fossils that have been around for 450 million years. Only four species are currently extant. Eurypterids were a rather fearsome group, first known from the Ordovician period 470 million years ago. They included the largest arthropods that have ever lived, a two and a half meter predator. Like the trilobites, Eurypterid diversity was reduced by the mass extinction event at the end of the Devonian. The surviving Eurypterids were all freshwater animals, leaving the role of apex predator in the marine environment to be taken over by vertebrates. Both Eurypterids and trilobites ultimately went out with the Permian-Triassic extinction event, the most devastating mass extinction in history. The arachnids comprise the terrestrial lineages of the Calicerata. The Zephosera respirate using book gills, which comprise many thin sheets which facilitate the diffusion of oxygen dissolved in water. In most arachnids, these are modified into book lungs, which perform the analogous function in air. Pycnogonids do not have book gills, relying exclusively on diffusion. Arachnids usually consume their food using extraoral digestion. That is, digestive juices are excreted into the prey, liquefying the nutrients, which are then sucked back into the arachnid's mouth. Clearly, this approach would be problematic underwater, but functions adequately in the terrestrial mode. Terrestrial arachnids also lost their compound eyes. Arachnids include familiar groups, such as spiders, mites, and scorpions, as well as groups that may not be so familiar to you. There are 11 living orders of arachnids. They are dominated by mites and spiders, which together comprise more than 90% of arachnid species. The largest group of arachnids, with about 50,000 species known, is the Akari comprising the mites and the ticks. This is an ecologically diverse group, including predators, herbivores, detritivores, parasites, disease vectors, and agricultural pests. It is one of the few groups of arachnids that includes regular consumers of vegetable and decaying matter. Tagmosis is reduced with little differentiation between the anterior cephalothorax and posterior abdomen. Mites lack venom, but some, such as the agriculturally important spider mites, secrete silk. Soil mites, most notably the orobatids, can be extremely abundant. The two largest lineages are the Parasitiformes, which includes the ticks, and the much more diverse Acariformes, including the soil mites, spider mites, and many others. Pseudoscorpions are widely distributed diminutive little arachnids that resemble true scorpions with the omission of the tail and sting. Most do possess venom, but it is located in a gland in the pedipalps. And like true scorpions, their pedipalps terminate in a pinching claw. Some secrete silk from a gland in their mouth parts. Pseudoscorpions use a peculiar means of transportation called foracy, meaning they grab onto flying insects and hitch a ride. Opiliones, or hoiwachen in Dutch, are sometimes confused with spiders, but they differ in several key characteristics. Unlike spiders, they lack both venom and silk. Unlike most arachnids, they have abandoned extraoral digestion and ingest solid food. 
Although they are typically predators, Apiliones are the only arachnids other than mites that regularly ingest plant matter. They also share with mites a reduction in tagmosis. They use a chemical defense based on acetic acid, which is excreted through repugnatorial glands. Apiliones have a penis that is used for direct copulation. Most arachnids transfer sperm indirectly via a spermatophore. Spiders also have direct copulation, but use the pedipalps as an intermittent organ. Solifugae are rather fearsome nocturnal predators of desert biomes. Their cephalothorax is dominated by their oversized chelicerae. They lack venom and silk, but can be fast and aggressive. Their pedipalps are used as antennae-like sensory organs. A short video introducing these animals follows. The solifuge does not eat dirt. It's simply digging with its large mandibles. By dusk, before the sun is set, it will have finished digging a hole where it will hide until it gets dark. The ground can offer little resistance to its serrated pincers. Although this is not their main function. Now that it's dark, it's time to hunt. Although its gait may seem unsteady, it's just being guided by its sensitive chemical and tactile detectors. With its first set of legs up in the air, it smells its surroundings and feels a presence nearby. The search has been successful. Its chelicerae are now performing the task for which they were designed, to crush and grind the body of its prey to a pulp so that the solifuge can readily digest it. Although insects are covered by a hard layer of chitin, similar to the shells of crustaceans that protects them from many attacks, solifugi have succeeded in developing instruments that can easily destroy these defenses. Sinulia are strange and obscure animals with only about 50 species known from tropical forests and caves. Unusually, the first known Ricinuleid was described from a fossil, only later were they found alive. Living Ricinuleae are eyeless, although some fossils have eyes. Scorpions are iconic arachnids armed with a sting at the tip of a tail-like telson. About 25 of the 1,300 known species are considered dangerous to humans. Recent research based on a 436 million year old fossil indicates that scorpions were among the first air-breathing animals. Scorpions have changed little since the Devonian, except that some fossil scorpions had compound eyes. Scorpions have a unique set of sensory organs called pectines, which are sensitive to vibrations. Scorpions are viviparous, giving birth to live young who are then carried on the back of the mother until at least their first molt. Scorpions fluoresce under UV light, which may play a role in light detection for these nocturnal animals. Amblypitchi are distinctive nocturnal animals found in caves and tropical forests. There are about 150 species. The first pair of legs is extremely long and whip-like, and antenna-like in function. The pedipalps are long and raptorial. Much like scorpions, mothers carry their young on their backs for a time. Amblypigids have been used as model organisms for the study of navigation, which they perform based largely on chemical cues. Uripigi have a whip-like tail. Near the base of this tail is an organ for spraying a defensive chemical compound composed mostly of acetic acid. The pedipalps are robust and raptorial. 
The first pair of legs are generally not used for walking and are instead held in an antenna-like mode. Like scorpions and amblypigi, mothers carry their young on their backs for a time. There are about a hundred species. Schizomata are small eyeless animals, usually less than five millimeters, found in tropical forests, caves, and the nests of some social insects. They are good jumpers. They are close relatives of Europigi and have similar raptorial, albeit less robust, pedipalps and antennae-like first leg, but they lack the acetic acid defense. There are about 250 species. Palpagradi are rarely encountered and poorly known. They are small, no more than three millimeters, eyeless animals restricted to caves and the interstitial spaces of subterranean environments. The pedipalps are leg-like and can be used for walking, but the first pair of legs is functionally antenna-like. There are about a hundred species. Spiders are a diverse and conspicuous part of the terrestrial fauna. They are characterized by the evolution of three key characteristics. The presence of abdominal silk glands, collisceral venom glands, and the modification of the male pedipalps into sperm transfer organs. More than 48,000 species are described, and more are being discovered all the time. Spiders use silk for a variety of functions. The most conspicuous of these is the web used to catch prey. But silk is also used to wrap prey, lie in burrows, protect eggs and young, to leave a trail when walking, and even to become airborne. Spinnerets can be morphologically complex organs with different types of spigots leading to glands of silk with different properties. Although not all spiders rely on webs to catch prey, all spiders use silk throughout their lives. Silk is famous for its physical properties. The properties of a material can be assessed using a stress-strain curve. Stress is a measure of the amount of force applied. Strain is the distortion the material undergoes with the application of force. The amount of force applied and the amount of distortion before failure is a measure of the amount of energy a material can absorb before breaking. The purpose of a spider web is to absorb the energy of a moving animal like a flying insect so that the spider can catch and eat it. Silk is among the best known materials for absorbing energy. The legs of a spider terminate in either two or three claws. The third median claw is generally used for walking on silk. This median claw is lost in some spider lineages that do not rely on webs for hunting. In some of these two-clawed spiders, leg tips also have a tuft of specialized seedy. Hygroscopic and molecular adhesion forces allow spiders with claw tufts to adhere to surfaces such as vertical walls. The iconic spiral form aerial spider web is known as an orb web. Orb web construction starts with a few frame lines to mediate between the complex environment and the attachment points necessary to make the architecture of the web functional. The first few radial lines define the hub or center of the web. More radial lines are added. Then the spider lays down a sparse, non-sticky temporary spiral starting at the hub and working toward the margin. Then the much denser sticky spiral is laid down. The spider progresses from the margin to the center, eating the temporary spiral as she goes. The spider attaches the sticky spiral to the radial lines at each crossing. Each time, the spider taps the next spiral out with her leg to maintain spacing of the spiral loops. Attach, tap, attach, tap, attach. Male spiders generally do not build webs once they reach maturity and instead focus on finding a mate.
Spiders use silk for aerial transportation through a practice called ballooning. To begin, the spider climbs to a high point and releases strands of fine silk. Lift is achieved through a combination of air currents and static electric fields. Ballooning makes spiders great colonizers of locations such as islands, mountaintops, and the lifeless landscapes left in the wake of major volcanic eruptions. What follows is a short film on ballooning. Of all the great flyers the world has ever known, it may come as a surprise that one of the best aviators in the animal kingdom doesn't even possess wings. Spiders, instead, use long fans of silk to carry them through the air, often for many hundreds of miles in a process known as ballooning. They have long been known to have flown the nest in such a way. Charles Darwin himself marvelled at hundreds of tiny spiders landing on the beagle while out at sea, and later recorded how they took off from the ship with great speeds even on a calm, windless day. During this time, there were two theories for how ballooning worked. The first theory, and the most obvious explanation, was that long strands of silk emitted by the spider catch the wind and the associated drag forces pull the spider aloft. But spiders will only balloon on days where the wind is a gentle breeze, which raises the questions of how there'd be enough force to pull the silk from the spider's spinnerets, and how could heavier spiders even become airborne at all? The second theory was that atmospheric electricity could also provide the force needed to get the spider aloft. Similar to how your hair lifts to stand on end when you rub a balloon on your jumper, spider silk could be lifted into the air by natural electrostatic forces in the atmosphere. These electric fields are present at all times all around the world, but are most noticeable during thunderstorms when they are at their strongest. Surprisingly, until now, the electrostatic theory of spider ballooning had never been tested. In our lab at the University of Bristol, we isolated spiders from any airflow or atmospheric electricity and generated our own controlled electric field at levels found in nature. In response, the spiders began to change their behaviour to perform tiptoeing, where they straighten their legs, raise their abdomen and release silk. This behaviour is only ever seen when a spider wants to balloon. Furthermore, once the spider was aloft, its altitude could be controlled by turning the electric field on and off. This demonstrates that spiders can balloon using electrostatic forces alone, but in all likelihood they would use a combination of both wind and electricity to balloon in their natural environments. So how do the spiders detect these electric fields? In this experiment, it was also observed that the minute sensory hairs on the spider's exoskeleton were similarly moved by the electric field. We can then infer that spiders can feel the charge in the air using the same sensory hairs they would use to detect a breeze. The results of this study show us that electrostatic forces could be an integral part of spider ballooning and by fully understanding the mechanisms behind it, we can better describe population dynamics, dispersal and ecological resilience, all of which are important for global ecology. Spider venom comes from a gland in the cephalothorax and is delivered through a pore in the fang of the chelicerae. The vast majority of spiders prey on insects and other arthropods, and their venom has little effect on us. But a few spiders have venom that is effective on vertebrates, including humans. In mature male spiders, the tip of the pedipalp develops into an intermittent organ. Often this structure is highly complex and may feature an assortment of inflating, rotating, and interlocking parts. However, there is no direct internal connection between the testes, where sperm is produced, and the pedipalp. So the male must first ejaculate through a slit in his abdomen, usually onto a specialized web, then draw the sperm into his pedipalp. Sperm transfer is achieved by inserting the terminal part of the male pedipalp into the female vulva. 
a recent data-rich phylogenetic study focused on the Calicerata. This study was based on more than 50 taxa and nearly 1,500 molecular loci. Intuitively, the results are surprising because the marine horseshoe crabs come out as sister to the Ricinuli. The main thrust of this result was well supported and held up under various perturbations of the analysis. This would seem to have serious implications for ideas about the terrestrialization of the chalicerates and is not easily explained.